Thank you, um, James, for the introduction. Um, so during this time I have in this lunch, this slot before lunch, I wanted to uh, discuss some of the highlights from our experimental program looking at the extreme physics and chemistry of carbon in two areas. So um, both looking at, um, oops, sorry. I did the one, one thing. Um, both looking at um, carbon forms for understanding earth and planetary interiors but also um, looking um, at these planet forms for material science applications. And of course, these areas are very closely linked because we use the same experimental tools to reach extreme conditions. And also, they both benefit from all the in situ and ex, and ex situ characterization tools to see what's going on to the carbon behavior at extreme conditions. Okay. So um, there's many questions to be answered about the forms of carbon in earth and planetary interiors. And so I just want to touch on a couple of them. So uh, this first one, how does the structure and bonding in carbon-bearing phases change with depth? And so we already heard a lot about uh, tetrahedrally coordinated carbon and carbonates um, at this meeting. But um, we had a um, former postdoc, Eglantine uh, Boulard, who um, led a project that really was enabled and supported by the DCO. Um, so her, during her PhD work, she had studied structural transitions in magnesite and magne magnesio siderite and found that there's a new high pressure structure. Oops, Ugh, I'm doing this, sorry. New high pressure structure for the extra diffraction. And then looking at samples quenched, recovered from high pressure, um, saw from spectroscopy a very interesting um, spectroscopic signature in the carbon K edge. Um, but from the refelt, but from the diffraction, we're not able to um, do reliable refelt refinement. So we didn't really exactly know where the tonic positions were. And from the, the spectroscopy she had performed was ex situ. So um, she followed up these experiments with in situ infrared study, looking at the high pressure uh, magnesium siderite um, phase. And so what she saw was the black spectra are infrared spectra for the threefold coordinated carbonate. But then the red spectra are, come from the, the high pressure form after high temperature and high pressure transformation. And so there's a lot of new peaks, but mainly want you to focus on this region from 1200 to 1300 uh, wave numbers. That, that's new. So and then you can follow these peaks with varying pressure. So to interpret this, these new peaks, this is a collaboration with uh, Ding Pan and Julia Galli. So they conducted some DFT calculations and found that in the carbonate structure, so the threefold coordinated carbonate, there's no peaks in the 1200, 1300 wave number region. But a calculation on the fourfold coordinated um, uh, carbon in carbonate, we find a peak at 1250 wave numbers. And this corresponds to a new stretching mode in the tetrally coordinated um, uh, CCO4 cluster. So, um, this is a nice theoretical and experimental validation of the fourfold coordinated carbonate. Okay, so then um, we care about other forms of carbon like melts. So because the title is viewing, I wanted to discuss one of the techniques that we had developed to, to image deep carbon. So we use nanoscale X-ray imaging um, using a nanoscale X-ray transition microscope. And so the parts of this microscope are basically the same as an uh, optical microscope you have a light source, in this case is a synchrotron X-ray source. You have your sample that you're going to be viewing. The zone plate acts like an objective lens, so it projects a magnified image onto then your detector. And so X-rays are a great light source because they're highly penetrating, so you can look in very complex environments like in a diamond cell. Also, X-rays have very short wavelengths, so they're great because in theory, they're not um, limited in terms of spatial, um, they're less limited in terms of spatial resolution. So we can image things with 30 to 40 nanometer spatial resolution. So you, you can collect really nice 2D radiographs. So here's an image that we collected in collaboration with Mark Harrison at UCLA. So we looked at one of his really old zircons, Hadean zircons. And within them, you can see these small carbonaceous inclusions. And they actually have hexagonal shapes. So probably graphite inclusion that's a few microns um, in size. And then if you're able to collect a lot of the 2D radiographs at different orientations, you th can then do tomography and reconstruct a 3D object. And so I'm gonna show uh, one of my favorite little movies that was, um, because here it just demonstrates an extreme example of why you wanna do 3D imaging. 
because then, you know, if you only had the 2D information, an extreme case, yes, could look like no. So this is like a little movie that's put together by a beamline scientist at one of these TXO instruments. Okay. All right. So um, but we, want, we also want to do this, though, at extreme conditions, so um, high pressure and hopefully ultimately high temperature. So we're doing imaging in a diamond cell. And so we're directing the X-ray beam perpendicular to the diamond axis. So we design new cells that have a lot of angular access. And one of the first things we looked at was just a little um, puck of tin. So it's about 10 microns in size. We use tin because it has very high X-ray absorption contrast, and we could also do diffraction. So to benchmark it, we compared our tomography results shown in blue with um, results from X-ray diffraction and found that they correspond really well. Okay. So then we moved on to um, glassy carbon. So this is an amorphous material, so it lacks long-range order, so we can't do diffraction to get at the volume and density directly. But then we can use the nanoscale imaging to actually image and sum up the volume of the sample. So we looked at this glassy carbon. So it's an amorphous carbon phase. It's all sp2 bonded. It's kind of based on a fullerene-like structure. And what we had found from previous measurements is actually that it undergoes some bonding changes at high pressure. So you see a loss of all the sp2 bonding in conversion to sp3. The sample remains amorphous, but also becomes exceptionally hard at high pressure. And so we wanted to see how the density was changing with, um, with pressure, with these bonding changes. So we did nanoscale X-ray imaging. In this case, again, because carbon is very, very light and it doesn't have a lot of electrons, it's hard to see with X-rays. And so we coated the sample with uh, platinum coating, and then we're just going to do negative contrast imaging and just look at the, coat the, I look at the um, coating and then count the vo uh, some of the volume inside of the coating. So here are, on the left, are some 2D radiographs from low pressure to high pressure as we're squashing our sphere, a glassy carbon sphere, and then you can see that we're just imaging the coating here and then summing up the volume. So we've collected on both increasing pressure, decreasing pressure, and followed how the volume changes. What we found is that it's fairly irreversible. You get 35% densification of the sample. So we're probably squeezing out some void space, but, I think, but the sample overall also seems to be densifying. Um, and you can see the shape is also changing quite dramatically as it, get, as it gets squashed. Right. Um, so emboldened by that, we started looking at a whole suite of different um, glassy materials, so SiO2 glass, also silicate glasses, and we looked at both um, coated versions and also, because we were a little bit worried about how the platinum coating might be affecting our results, um, we're able to look at some disks of uh, silica glass that weren't coated. And we find actually the results are very similar, and around 30 GPA, there seems to be a change in compressibility in our silica glass. Oh, sorry, so this is work from a uh, former postdoc, uh, Jean Liu. Okay. So um, that's great for amorphous solids. We really do want to look at the melts, and that would require some in situ high temperature work, and that's still kind of work in progress, but there's actually a lot of experimental challenges that have presented themselves, and we're trying to do in situ high pressure and high temperature um, imaging. But ultimately, you want to look at mantle melts with volatiles, also look at molten iron rich, iron carbide melts, and also the interaction between melts and solid phases. And so um, we have a study here where, a previous study where we didn't look at, we looked at iron rich alloy in a silicate matrix. And so the portions in red in these images are the iron rich alloy, and then the gray regions are the starting silicate matrix. And so it just shows some reconstructions from four different pressures, 25 GPA, 39, 52 and 64 GPA, where um, the probably most dramatic thing you can see is that at lower pressures, you have isolated blobs. So the iron alloy is not forming an interconnected network. But at higher pressures, you can see that now the iron alloy is wetting the surface of the bridgemanite grains. And so there's some, it seems that there's some sort of change in percolative ability somewhere between 40 and 50 GPA in this um, combination of iron alloy and a silic bridgemanite matrix. Um, and as Sergey had uh, mentioned on yesterday during his lightning talk, we also want to continue to look at the impact of the changing structure on carbonate behavior. So there's a lot of properties, also properties of the melt that we'd like to know more about, and also for other new um, carbon-bearing phases. Okay, so with um, the remaining time, I would like to also provide some examples of 
looking at um, a material science aspect. So here the overarching uh, goals and questions would be something like, um, can we find new carbon bearing phases with desirable properties? And so this includes using pressure to study how the structure then affects the materials property. And also, can we use pressure to understand and design new synthesis paths for materials of interest? And so um, I think Taras had asked the question about diamondoids. We actually have done quite a bit of study on diamondoids. So these are re these really interesting um, cage-like, ultra-stable, saturated hydrocarbons. They're based on cages of carbon-carbon frameworks that can be superimposed on a diamond lattice. And so like the simplest uh, diamondoids adamantane, so it's one carbon cage, I uh, sorry, one diamond cage. And then you can have diamantane, which is two fused diamond cages, trimantane, three fused cages. And these are the lower diamondoids. And then you get to higher diamondoids, like tetramantane, pentamantane, and so on, where then you can have isomers. So it gets pretty comp can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, there, diamondoids have properties that are intermediate between bulk diamond and hydrocarbons. They're found naturally in very minute qualities, the quantities in petroleum, but they're really interesting um, building blocks to kind of uh, study. So because they have um, atomic uniformity and they can have, you can look at different numbers of fused cages, also different dimensionalities and see what happens when you compress them. So we looked at a suite of diamondoids with different numbers of cages and you know, from zero, zero D to, to implying three D and compress them. And we found that they, um, from the equation of state, they have indeed intermediate compressional behavior between bulk carbon phases, so graphite and diamond, and then hydrocarbons like methane and benzene. Um, so they're, they're pretty close in terms of compressibility to uh, fullerenes, which is probably not that surprising. But there's also a, a dimensionality trend where the 0D, or the adamantane, is more compressible compared to the 2 and 3D um, diamondoids. And we also find that they, while they undergo um, phase transitions, the phase transitions just involve a, a, a more efficient packing of the di diamondoid molecules. The diamondoid molecule always remains intact, so it's very, very durable to the highest pressures that we measured. Also, it's very durable over repeated cycling. So we, we cycled adamantane through diamantane through like 20, 30 compression and decompression cycles, and we found that the Raman spectra also visually looks the same. So it may um, lend itself to being a nice protective coating if you want to look for an application for this material. But also because um, the diamondoid has these diamond cages, we thought it might be a good precursor for making bulk diamond. So um, one of our postdocs, Sogi Park, um, she looked at a suite of diamondoids and put them in a diamond cell and compressed them and heated them and then used in-situ ramen and extra diffraction, and then did ex-situ work um, with eels and TM to get the recovered products, see what she made. And so uh, what she found was for, again, I probably can't read this, but for a suite of diamondoids at lower pressures and temperatures, not surprisingly, she formed graphite, higher pressures and temperatures formed diamond. And so what um, was nice was that actually the diamondoids form at especially lower temperatures, so fairly you know, moderate pressures, but low temperatures um, for direct diamondoid to diamond synthesis. And also they form rapidly. So at 20 GPA, you can get conversion in less than 20 microseconds. So seem to be pretty good precursors for making diamond. Okay, and then, so here too, you can have many other forms of carbon and carbon rich materials to study. You can functionalize um, your diamondoids. So you can add different chemical groups to diamondoids and tune their functionality. We can look at diamond films, um, onion carbon fullerenes, nanotubes. Um, and I want to mention a little bit about um, graphene nanoribbons because it's kind of an interesting, very simple study. You'll see when I get there. So graphene nanoribbons are of interest because uh, unlike graphene, which is a semi-metal, so it has no band gap, um, graph uh, when, you, when you actually make it into ribbons, so just strips of graphene, it becomes a semiconductor and with a tunable band gap, depending on the width and the edge geometry of your graphene. And so that um, makes it kind of a, a great interest for a potential co uh, component in electronic devices, but they're really hard to make. It's really hard to have a good yield of high quality graphene nanoribbons. And so um, one of our colleagues at, Stan at Stanford in the chemistry department um, and his uh, visiting scholar, Chengxin Chen, 
came over and had a pretty simple idea. Can we just squash the carbon nanotubes and then make nanoribbons? Because people have been trying to make um, nanoribbons from nanotubes. So we said, okay, that's a pretty simple experiment. We'll just take the solution of the carbon nanotubes, compress it, and then add an oxidizing agent to unzip the edge. And then hopefully we'll make graphene nanoribbons. And so indeed that's what happened. So um, here's some TM uh, measurements. So before compression on the graphene nanoribbon, uh, sorry, graphene nanotube, you can see the edges are a little bit out of focus and that's because of the curvature of your nanotube. But after we've squashed the nanotube into a nano ribbon, a graphene nano ribbon, you can see that the um, sample is now in focus, not in focus because you have a flat surface. So we made nano ribbons and using um, AFM measurements, we found that actually have a pretty good yield, so 40% yield from nanotubes to graphene nano ribbons. Um, a lot of literature doesn't even report yields because they're really hard to make, so we found good yield. The downside, of course, is that you're making, you're using like nanograms of samples, so you're not making a lot, of, not a lot of these ribbons, but you can make them high quality, and the collaborators also made a field effect of transistor, which worked really well, so um, promising at least to understand how one can make them, but we just have to think about making them in a more efficient or a larger um, amount. So um, there's just, just a few examples of the many studies that have already been conducted and are being conducted, and of course there's many other deep carbon forms to study for you know, 2020 and beyond. I did want to end with, um, because I was looking at the little clips that Bob showed yesterday from the 2008 Sloan uh, Deep Carbon Workshop at Broadband Campus, reminded me of how quickly a decade can pass. So this is our lab in 2008, um, when I was just getting started at Stanford, and then like 10 years have passed. So, uh, this is earlier this year in 2019, um, our group, and I definitely, definitely want to acknowledge the many um, researchers and collaborators who came, who are in our group and are still in our group, um, who worked on deep carbon projects. So I hope that will continue on to you know, the next decade and beyond. So thank you very much for your attention.